السلام علیکم و رحمت اللہ وبرکاتہ ہلو سٹوڈنٹس ہوپ یو آر آل ڈوئنگ گڈ اینڈ ٹوڈے وی آر گوئنگ ٹو ٹیک دا سیکنڈ پارٹ آف دا سیریز دیٹ از ہینڈلنگ کلینکل اسپیسمنس ٹیکنیکس اینڈ میتھڈس پارٹ ٹو سو ان دی فرسٹ لیکچر وی ہیو ٹاکڈ اباؤٹ دی کلیکشن آف سیمپلس فرام ڈفرینٹ کائنڈس آف اسپیسمنس using two major things that is sterile cups and the catheters now in today's lecture we'll be talking about these major three techniques that is needle aspiration that is sterile swabs and finally we'll end it up with intubation now uh, as far as needle uh, aspiration is uh, concerned we can use it for uh, taking out the specimen of the blood from the patients as it is shown in the here the needle and then sucking the blood up from the veins then we can also be able to collect this uh, cerebrospinal fluid in case of any uh, meningeal infections in your brain and this is also done by needles but that uh, part is being done by a specialized physician and that technique is called lumbar puncture now we can also use uh, needle aspiration for collecting pus although sometimes what happens is the two techniques can uh, you know overlap so i will tell you that sometimes we use swab also to collect the pus but in in majority of the cases uh, the technique that is used uh, is the needle aspiration now uh, after that when we are talking about the open wounds and the abscesses which are in which we also use uh, needle aspiration so in this case you might be thinking we have a needle and then we have to aspire it up and you know you can store it in your store media and then you can transport also okay Con uh, talking about the sterile swabs so sterile means it should be uh, you know it should be free from any uh, contamination or any microorganism so most of them uh, they come uh, fr from the companies and the companies use many different techniques to make these steriles okay so one of them is they can use uv radiations to sterilize them so there are different uh, others are gamma radiated because they are high energy radiations so in this case uh, they come to your lab in the form of sterile form so only thing is once you open it then it doesn't remain sterile so you have to uh, tackle it very carefully in that case we use uh, sterile swabs from collecting the samples or specimens from your throat and in case of the covid patients we take this uh, specimens from the uh, snares that is the nostrils so as it's depicted in this picture both uh, the person who is collecting it and the person who is staying in the car both are wearing the mask so this is the only safety right now we have against covid nothing else okay so the third one is intubation as i told you it's uh, in means inside and putting a tube inside a patient is called intubation so in case of getting some samples from uh, uh, stomach such as uh, stomach tissues to d detect if uh, it it is it has some stomach ulcers or uh, does it have uh, h pylori inside and this is used uh, by using a syringe that is attached to one end of the tube and the other is put uh, inside uh, inside the patient through their nostrils okay so this is called uh, stomach stomach intubation where you put the levine tube most of the tubes are available most commonly because it's a more flexible so the name of the tube is levine tube l e v i n so these tubes are used to put the inside the uh, patient's uh, nostrils and then we have to ensure that it doesn't go to our uh, airways it goes to the uh, i mean uh, because airways are on the front and then your uh, food pipe is uh, at the back so we ensure that it goes inside the food pipe and not into the air pipe and particularly uh, patient will get irritated because it has a um, covering on its uh, trachea that's called epiglottis so finally when it comes then the pipe is inside the stomach and you can collect the specimens by using a syringe okay now another thing we have in case of intubation is tracheal intubation so what is tracheal intubation this as we had we have put this pipe into the stomach i mean the food pipe here we are using to put it into the bronchi or lungs so this can be done uh, directly by putting this uh, kind of instrument inside the patient's mouth and it is very essential because uh, we provide the oxygen supply 
to him uh, from this and at the same time we can also uh, put him onto the ventilator if the condition of the patient is not good okay so these are the three uh, things we are trying to discuss today and we'll discuss them one by one so first of all neural aspiration okay so as we talk about needle, uh, needle aspiration it is used to collect the specimens uh, aseptically so what is aseptically means you have to work under sterile conditions and you have to be very careful not to contaminate your specimen okay while collecting it particularly uh, there should be no contamination from the anaerobic bacteria which grow um, uh, without the oxygen now as I told you in the previous slide we can collect three kinds of uh, specimens by using a needle aspiration along with uh, the wounds and the abscesses open wounds and abscesses abscesses are like close we call them in Kashmiri as fefur so it, it just looks very closed and surrounded by a lot of inflammation and pain okay so for these uh, samples stringent aseptic techniques should be utilized it means you have to wear gloves on your uh, hands so that the normal microflow of your hand doesn't touch the sample this is one technique second is you have to clean the area of that patient where you are collecting uh, his sample so you can clean it by using uh, you know ethanol swabs which are present uh, already commercially present or if you don't have you can put the 70 percent ethanol on the cotton and just wipe out the area where you are going to uh, take the specimen from so you can either take uh, uh, take directly from his arms or you can if, if, it's, if you uh, the veins are not visible so you can try to get it from the uh, veins that are running on his uh, upper hand so there are the, these are the two ways uh, where you can collect the blood in this case uh, when a patient has to uh, do MRI that is for any uh, uh, detection of any uh, cancer or something so most of the time uh, the needles are put inside the upper side of the hand or the side where the veins are more visible okay so that is what you have to see you have to avoid the skin contamination second thing is to prevent the blood from clotting or entrapping the microorganisms which you are trying to detect uh, which are responsible for one particular disease so uh, that tube comes with uh, the tube is called vacutainer if you are collecting blood vacutainer so it has a big needle like this and then you can put your vac vacutainer inside this and it sucks up the blood with its own you don't no need to pull up the syringe because it has vacuum inside so once you put in the needle inside it will collect the blood itself so this uh, vacutainer it contains two things that is heparin and uh, heparin and sodium citrate and they are present within this so when you put the sample inside they don't allow it to coagulate and this can help us in two things one is clotting and then second is entrapping any microorganisms within the sample okay now coming to uh, techniques which we can uh, where needle aspiration is needed is collecting for the blood specimens so uh, why do uh, physicians suggest blood specimens uh, there are different uh, reasons for that uh, and uh, most of the time if the infection of the, pa if the um, patient is having uh, systemic inf infections or localized infections so this needle aspiration is the uh, choice that is recommended in suspected patients of acute sepsis sepsis means uh, the complete blood is being infected because of some infection and uh, that is uh, that is being now coming into the blood and it's spreading to the other organs as well another uh, way why you why the physician recommends uh, a blood sample is if a per person is uh, suffering from a, fe a fever which has uh, no uh, reason behind it so if the uh, organism is unknown whether it's viral fever or this bacterial fever so in order to check that the physician suggests a blood sample in case of uh, patients uh, who have suspected inf infection from endocarditis so either acute or subacute aspiration is done 
and after you take that you have to label uh, the vacutainer and uh, different tests blood tests as i told you are being done so one is the complete blood uh, complement test complete uh, blood sorry uh, complete blood count in which we, we usually call it in the labs at cbc it will give you every kind of information that will include your uh, kidney function test that will include your uh, liver function test that will uh, tell you about your neutrophil counts okay that will tell you about your platelet counts so platelet are very important for the coagulation of the blood so if a patient uh, normally uh, the level should be uh, more than 200 per deciliter of the blood but if the levels drop uh, be, uh, lower than 200 then uh, say for example a patient is having 180 so uh, this is not a good condition if a patient is suffering from cancer first of all his blood platelet count is checked before giving him any chemotherapy okay so if the blood count i mean the platelet count counts above so the chemotherapy is continued if it decreases to uh, 180 or 150 then the patient cannot have a chemotherapy for his cancer so that's why uh, different uh, blood specimens are needed for different purposes and the easy way to do it is by needle aspiration so for uh, adult patients as well as pediatric patients the protocols may vary how to collect the blood from then uh, if a patient is suspected of having any bacterial infection so the physician will order a blood culture and we'll see in the next slide how blood culture is being done so as i was telling that you have to work under uh, sterile conditions so how can you do that so you had you can you had to do all the processing of the blood samples in this biosafety cabinet it can be biosafety level second no problem because in case of uh, more uh, i mean pathogenic organisms you you can you have to use uh, biosafety level 3 okay in case of the viruses like covid viruses if you're dealing with covid viruses you have to use biosafety level 3 you cannot work without that when you are processing your samples uh, in case of mycobacterium tuberculosis this is also a condition that it should be biosafety 3 lab cabinet so here you can see that the person is wearing his gloves to avoid any contamination of from his skin from the normal flora normal microflora and this is how he's putting these samples in the racks in the series so that uh, no miscalculations are being done while during the test so uh, again if a physician is ordering a blood culture so then it has to be ordered by him and then you can culture it. We'll shortly see what is uh, what is uh, are the four steps of culturing. So this is the vacutainer I was talking about. So they will have their uh, labels around, and then you can just uh, either you can you you will have you will have already barcode um, mentioned on this, and you can match that barcode with the patient's slip barcode which you have put on his requisition form. So you can easily uh, you know compare the two and uh, uh, correlate that whether the same specimen is uh, belonging to the same uh, you know patient which has come uh, with this sample okay so that there is no cross uh, result reporting which can lead to very uh, deadly consequences for the patients now there are some major pitfalls as with every technique there are pitfalls so uh, one is that uh, in case of uh, interpreting the blood culture if there is some contamination from the normal flora of the skin uh, then uh, there will be no use of uh, that blood culture test so uh, you have to be very careful you have to work under aseptic conditions and that i already told you so this biosafety cabinet is uh, having uh, hepa filters hepa filters and these filters can easily uh, clean up uh, clean up the you know the air and it can run either uh, like from top to bottom or it can run from sideways to prevent any contamination coming from the air okay now coming to the blood culture as i told you let us see what are the four techniques that are being used if the physician orders your blood culture so in first case you are taking uh, the sample from the patient you are taking the sample from the patient by needle aspiration and then the volume should be around 5 to 10 ml, 10 ml because if you need it for culture, I mean for other tests also, so you have to collect uh, much of the volume. So at least 10, 5 to 10 ml is okay, it's adequate. Then you can uh, add it uh, to the already existing uh, liquid broth that is already having a uh, fluid about 50 to 100 ml. Broth means liquid. So then you can directly inject the sample in the broth. And what happens in the broth, the bacteria will start to grow. 
okay because it, the broth contains all the nutrients that are required for its growth now uh, if you want to you know sustain that or if you want to keep the record for a more longer time if uh, if, if if the blood culture is being recommended then what you have to do is you have to subculture this liquid so once the once once you have put the sample inside you have to allow it to grow at uh, 37 degrees celsius which is our normal physiological temperature and that is being done by putting it in a th uh, 37 degrees celsius incubator so you put uh, your uh, these liquids bottles in there and let it let the bacteria grow and then when it grows then uh, you can just subculture it you know you can just take up the uh, up, uh, take up it from the bottles and put it to put it on the surface of the uh, plates okay generally uh, patient has to um, <coughs> it is being done to if you, if, if it's a blood culture a blood culture agar sorry blood agar then you can differentiate between hemolytic and non-hemolytic bacteria here so it can act as a differential media hemolytic and non-hemolytic <coughs> i'm sorry hemolytic and non-hemolytic bacteria so then uh, the time it took to grow in the broth is uh, very less it can be overnight only but uh, when you uh, put it on the plates it may take more time to grow again you have to put the plates in the uh, i mean 37 degrees celsius incubator so how can you check it the temperature you can put a thermometer inside and you can uh, you know frequently check whether the your uh, incubator is maintaining that uh, temperature or not okay so now when the you put it for a day or two then you will see uh, different small 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 spots growing on your culture and that is your bacterial growth so each uh, each spot that you see for example here so it is one organism okay one microorganism that has done that has divided and finally made it its population okay so this is not one bacteria here what you are seeing here is a colony okay so one bacteria when multiplies it makes a colony like structure and that is visible by a naked eye you don't need to see it through the microscope okay now coming to the next slide when we have to take uh, the specimen from the cerebrospinal fluid when a doctor is suspect you know suspecting any uh, meningital infections okay for example meningitis so he recommends uh, neural aspiration technique for your collecting the specimen that is cerebrospinal fluid so the technique is called lumbar puncture and it's used by again aspiration but this time you have to use a sterile the technique is uh, in case of other samples sterile needle aspiration is performed under strict asepsis so surgically collected the specimen should be done by the physician is required here so what does the physician do he makes the patient to lie down on his side and then he is very expert in getting it from the your spinal cord and that is called the technique is called lumbar puncture okay this is also uh, done when the patient has uh, much inflammation in the brain and uh, uh, then uh, doctors if, if there is a, if there is a tumor for example in the brain so it will uh, push towards the meninges and it can uh, you know uh, infect the meninges also so in that case uh, you can also uh, take the specimen from the lumbar puncture okay now specimens uh, are transported in a sterile lumbar collection screw cap tubes that is what i am showing you here this is a whole kit of this when you do the lumbar puncture the whole kit comes in this box and you will uh, take them out so it will contain uh, all needles and you, it can contain all, also different kinds of uh, tubes which are labeled for example here one then two then three then four so what you have to do is you have to take uh, uh, you know specimens uh, three to four specimens at one particular time so you, as i told you the volume should be around uh, four to five ml is optimal for the adults but in case of uh, children uh, 1 ml 0.5 ml to 1 ml is enough but uh, in some cases additional fluid uh, may be required if other tests are ordered so that's why i told you that uh, we should take multiple samples at uh, one lumbar puncture depending upon the patient's adult or uh, uh, a kid so at least one uh, tube out of uh, second or third collection so that is 
this is your second collection this is your third collection out of them one one should be uh, sent to the bacteriology uh, bacteriology lab first that is your microbiology lab so before the other st uh, studies uh, such as cell count can be done by flow cytometry this will be available in your immunological laboratory flow cytometry and another is biochemical tests you can just send them to the clinical biochemistry labs uh, to whatever uh, a physician has suggested the test for so in this case if a physician also occurs a routine culture and uh, it, it, it he has to specify the source so the source will be like uh, CF, CSF and in this case uh, if uh, cryptococcal antigens cryptococcal means it's a it means it's a spherical bacteria so if it's antigens or any viral studies are uh, desired from separately so uh, then the order should have been uh, already received by the you should get an order from the physician to do uh, the other appropriate uh, tests so these will be separate from the, uh, the other uh, i mean if there is a uh, infection in the cerebral spinal fluid with the bacteria so in case of other uh, viral studies also if you if, you, if the physician is suspecting that there, there can be a viral infection so that has to be uh, ordered separately and then uh, you know the test can be done okay now uh, talking about sinus specimens uh, so maybe most of the people uh, may not understand what sinus is I think uh, if you are a third year student by now you must have been knowing about it so we have different uh, types of uh, sinuses based on their location uh, particularly on our face so we have frontal uh, sinuses that is just located on you above the eyebrows then we have ethmoid sinuses that is between just between the that is right over here when my eye, I close my eyes it's here okay and then the maxillary sinus is uh, over here and the siphonoid sinus is when it goes runs towards this is your uh, uh, ethmoid sinus and this is your siphonoid sinus okay so a little below than the ethmoid sinus that's what I have shown it in the figure so most of the times a patient is suggested to I mean uh, we, a patient is uh, recommended to do the test particularly in case if he has a sinusitis problem or a rhinitis rhin, 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 problem okay so in this case if there's an inflammation uh, as i told you inflammation can be of two types if it is acute so remember that if the inflammation is acute it's good for us but if the inflammation becomes chronic means it is it is there from a very long time and it's not going so then it becomes a problem for us so in this case if a patient is having a sinusitis problem so uh, the sinus uh, you know you have to take the sinus specimens from uh, different kinds of uh, sinus uh, locations okay so here are they labeled you can see the maxillary sinus the siphonine sinus more particularly and the ethmoid sinus so there's a very little uh, space between these two that is ethmoid and siphonine sinus frontal is very easy okay now talking about collection of this specimens from the nasal drainage or nasopharyngeal cultures usually do not correlate well so if you try to collect the samples uh, by the nasal drainage or uh, the nasopharyngeal part so they will not correlate uh, with the infection of the true sinus infection so therefore uh, that's why in this case also needle aspiration is suggested so doctor can directly take uh, you know needle and put it inside the uh, frontal uh, sinus and collect the fluid or uh, wherever uh, the patient uh, you know the doctor suspects uh, the infection based on his physical checkup in this case uh, sinus content as much possible as you can collect so minimum uh, if the patient is not uh, you know comfortable minimum you can take one ml so pus uh, aspirated from the sinus should be examined in a uh, gram staining film first and by culture on aerobic or anaerobic uh, blood agar plates okay so this test is being done to diagnose as i told in the beginning that is uh, tested for uh, rhinitis sorry rhin rhinitis and sinusitis conditions in this case a uh, 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 patient has allergic you know reflux he keeps on sneezing again and again now talking about transportation it should be very immediately transported 
and all the specimens to the laboratory to optimize its uh, bacterial viability or recovery means the bacterial uh, bacteria should be alive uh, when it reaches to the lab so that's why it should be transported as uh, immediately as possible so the bacteria so that if the bacteria is alive you can test it and uh, detect it which kind of a bacteria it is and then you can report it to the doctor so that he can provide a uh, right uh, medication for the patient okay now coming to the pus specimen so uh, as I told you in the first lecture uh, the, what is pus so pus oozes out from uh, either the open wounds or uh, it remains there inside uh, under underneath uh, the between the dermis and the epidermis so what hap what it is uh, actually made up of the pus is a, a mixture of neutrophils Neutrophils have a lifespan of around seven to eight days and they are the first to come to the defense when any infection is coming apart from the localized macrophages which are called big eaters. So the neutrophils help in ingesting these microorganisms and uh, they have a lifespan of seven to eight days when they die. So along with the neutrophils and the tissue where the infection has been detected and along with the microorganisms that's causing this infection. So that is what pus is made of out so you can see it as a yucky white fluid coming out okay it's a yucky fluid a white or you can say it's like uh, uh, not milky I will say it's like uh, you know more dark than the white uh, a, a creamy color okay it's about the color is creamy okay so what is a mixture of as I told you it's a mixture of neutrophil carcasses the de dead bodies of the neutrophils the underlying tissues and the microorganisms so how are you supposed to take the sample so you have to uh, aspirate but from the deepest portions of the pus or you can aspirate from the lesion for example the surrounding part is this this is the edge of the pus so either you can directly put it and get the deep from the deepest part or the lesion or the exudate of the lesion or exudate and with a syringe and a needle that's needle aspiration and you can put it in a sterile tube you can also collect the biopsy biopsy means you have to collect a tissue sample biopsy means that so where you are going to take the tissue samples from not from the center but from the margin or base of the infected lesions i mean if you consider this as a lesion so you have to take it from its boundaries if a biopsy is being asked to test okay so uh, also collect the well uh, that's what he's saying that also collect the biopsy sample from the advancing margins of the infant lesions after you after the excision and drainage has been done so you should ensure that uh, the tissue should be uh, collected uh, once you clear this uh, you know drainage part the volume of the specimen now now it, it directly influences the transport time so how large volumes of the prolonged material maintain the viability of the anaerobes so the volume if it is more it can remain alive for a longer period of transport time so that that is how the volume is being correlated is directly proportional to the transport time so if you collect more of the sample in transportation more of the bacteria will remain viable and then can be tested in the lab so if there is a delay for example sometimes there are delays in the lab you are well aware of that so if it, there is uh, some delay and you cannot avoid it is unavoid uh, in in case of unavoidable circumstances you can store it in a refrigerator and the temperature is around uh, you can put it directly into the fridge temperature is around minus four degrees celsius okay no no not minus four sorry four degrees celsius uh, the recovery of the anaerobes is uh, compromised if the transport time exceeds three hours so you should uh, ensure that even if it's stored uh, then maximum time you can store it in, in fridge is around three hours and then uh, then the recovery becomes compromised and uh, most of the uh, bacteria that you know cause the pus like situation are anaerobics because they don't uh, require oxygen so they can you know uh, maintain their viability there but when you recover it from the as a specimen then you you should be transported uh, as early as uh, possible okay now coming to the open wounds so what are open wounds for example if i am going through uh, on my bike and uh, my bike suddenly skids off and i get wounds on my arm like this okay or like this on my feet fine so 
First, what you have to do is when a patient comes uh, to the emergency, if you are there as a paramedical staff, so what you have to do is you should first cleanse the wound margins and the superficial area thoroughly with the sterile saline. Sterile saline is around 0.9% NaCl that is already present uh, in your emergency. Okay, it's also it also comes packed ready-made. So you can first do it by cleaning the wound by changing the sponges. Once you have a one, uh, you know, once you wipe it around, then throw it. Use another one, and then uh, applying it at the part of the uh, margins as well as the superficial area. So then uh, you remove the superficial uh, exudates if there is any liquid. Also, you can again use the swabs or there are some sponges available in your lab. So you can just uh, you know try to dry it out and you can take out the overlying debris for example if there is dust if there is sand particularly on the roads so definitely it will be in the wounds of the patient as well so in this case what you do is you can use a scalpel and just remove uh, the debris from the wound so for infected uh, bite wounds for example if a rabbit dog bites a patient and he comes to your uh, clinic so what you have to do is you first uh, aspirate, uh, aspirate the pus by using uh, you know needle aspiration or obtain it at a time of uh, incision or drainage. So collection sufficient tissue should be taken around uh, three to four mm for the biopsy and uh, curate sample. Curate sample means uh, the sample you are collecting uh, from uh, this uh, wound. So from the base or uh, through the advancing margins of the lesion. So when the wound is there. So you can either take it from the base, it means, or, or the margins of the tissue. Now for aerobic culture, means bacteria which are growing under, uh, you know, well oxygen levels. So this, for this examination, you have to place the tissue in the sterile container as uh, we already know that we have to maintain aseptic conditions with uh, a small amount of non-bacteriostatic uh, saline. So the tube that will be uh, given to you, it will already have some normal saline in it and it will be bacteriostatic means it will not allow it to replicate more but will keep it alive for a time period so that you can test them in your lab. And um, when you put it in the normal saline, it also, you know, keeps it uh, your sample, I mean the specimen, from drying out. For ca in case of now anaerobic uh, culture bacteria, bacteria which are which can live without oxygen, which can, uh, you know, so if it's appropriate, place the tissue in again, you have, a, you have to use a special transport uh, tube for it, that's called anaerobic transport tube, okay. So this was about the open wounds. Now coming to the uh, collection of the specimens from the abscesses. So as I told you, you can see in this figure, this is abscess and it is uh, it has many uh, cardinal signs. One of them is inflammation and inflammation. If you touch the surrounding of, the, see if you touch this uh, surrounding part of the abscess, so you'll find that it is a little bit harder and some fluid is equivalent inside. So there are five cardinal signs of inflammation that is repel R E P E L. So R means there will be redness present. Okay, there is redness. E means there will be edema. The fluid is you know coming out of the tissues and accumulating here. That's called edema. P means uh, there is pain also inside. When you touch it, the patient is definitely feeling pain. And this pain is because of the prostaglandins, particularly about prostaglandin E2. Okay. Now comes E. E means heat. Okay. So you will find also the, uh, the, uh, the area around this is a little bit warm. And L is sometimes the patient feels loss of function in that area. It means it, num it numbs, the, the, you feel numbness in the area. So uh, what is a closed abscess which doesn't drain out? It's, uh, you know, uh, it's yucky material. So an abscess is a collection of pus, the yucky, yucky part, the creamy part that has built up within the tissue of the body due to the bacterial infection. It's mostly caused by Staphylococcus aureus. It's a gram-positive bacteria. Okay, and that sometimes is if a patient is even treating him, there are some strains of uh, Staphylococcus aureus which are methicillin resistant. So this is called drug resistance. In that case, you have to do uh, drug susceptibility assay, which will be a, uh, is a different topic. 
drug susceptibility assay and this will be covered in uh, one of the lectures so in case the patient is having uh, the drug resistance to aureus that is causing this abscess so then the uh, then the doctor has advised for drug susceptibility assay so that he can determine which drug can work against them and always remember this drug resistance problem is a very big problem nowadays and a time will come if we don't abide by the you know by the um, rules then uh, this drug resistance is going to be a very big problem for us in future right now it's also uh, you know creating a havoc for us in case of tb many of the drugs are not working right now just because uh, most of the strains are becoming drug resistance and this is because of very one reason and that reason is non adherence to the antibiotic regimen for example uh, if a doctor gives you a antibiotic and he tells you to use it for 7 days you use it for 3 days and you feel um, you know you feel you are getting better and you leave the regimen you don't continue that for the 7 days and that is what leads to the emergence of drug resistance strains okay for example if i tell you that there are around if there are 100 uh, you know bacteria up, uh, around in the environment and they are all you know susceptible bacteria and out of them one is drug resistant so when you use the antibiotic all the susceptible bacteria will go on and this one bacteria out of 100 for example i'm giving just an example out one out of 100 is having the resistant gene inside so when you use the antibiotic for just few days and it will wipe out the normal bacteria for example uh, normal susceptible staph aureus and then this will get an opportunity the drug resistant uh, uh, strain it will get an opportunity to have a lot of nutrients and it will multiply so that's why the drugs will not work then so same is happening in case of the tuberculosis because the regimen is for 6 months the patient uh, you know he gets okay he feels the symptoms are gone by the 3 3 three months so he leaves the uh, you know the drug regimen and that leads to the mdr tb that is multi drug resistant tb so uh, never uh, always suggest uh, your patients to complete the drug regimen if you are in contact with any of them so uh, what are the signs and symptoms the signs and symptoms of abscess include redness as i told you and there are three uh, card five cardinal signs of inflammation so they are there so that as i told you uh, the redness pain vomiting and swelling that's edema the swelling may uh, you know feel fury uh, fluid filled if, if, if the physician uh, presses it so now how are you supposed to correct the uh, specimen if it is closed so again uh, needle aspiration will help you in that so first you disinfect uh, the area and then uh, you can you simply aspirate uh, and take the blood culture out of it and uh, that is uh, collecting the material through needle and syringe if the initial aspiration fails to uh, you know get your specimen though then what you have to do is in in case of relieving this uh, you know the hardiness of this place so you can just inject a sterile uh, non uh, bacteriostatic saline as i told you normal saline is 0.9% nacl and it is mostly used for when you inject it it will you know it the fluid will become it will it will relieve the hardness within the abscess and then you can repeat the uh, aspirate and again uh, collect it in the second attempt so once you have got the uh, specimen just yes, place the contents in the sterile tube for examination as per the doctor has recommended uh, so staphylococcus uh, as i told you this uh, this staphylococcus it is also responsible for tonsillar abscesses okay apart from the other abscesses so this was about uh, closed comedons or abscesses so now we are talking about this technique that is sterile swabs okay so let us take one example at a time so what are sterile swabs the most commonly uh, method that's used to collect the specimen from the anterior uh, near for example your uh, you know your nostrils and throat is a sterile swab and particularly this technique is in use for collecting the specimens from the covid suspected patients i showed you in the first picture how it's been collected so a sterile swab is particularly made up of a rayon or a calcium alginate this is also used in formulation of nanoparticles okay nanoparticles so nanoparticles uh, what happens 
either the stirrers will be made up of rayon or it will be made up of calcium alginate i told you it's uh, another application that is formation of nanoparticles so if, if if a drug is there and if it is you know put in small small nanoparticles which have a dimension of around 10 to minus 9 meters so they will be very small so the drug can remain within these particles and they can be released in a sustained way means they will be uh, released in like uh, for example they will be released for some time and then again released again after some time and then again released so there will be a sustained release of the drug and that will be very beneficial for the patient okay so here the uh, application is different it is used in the sterile swabs so we have rayon we have calcium alginate and particularly one of the most commonly used sterile swab is dacron tipped polystyrene applicator same in case of covid patients you can use that so many commercially uh, you know manufactured swabs contain a transport media definitely it should have a transport media and as i told you most of the transport medias are semi solid in nature they are jelly like okay and uh, designed to preserve the micro uh, microorganisms in a variety uh, you know pr preserve this variety of the microorganisms that can be present uh, in the uh, you know nostrils of the patients so if i tell you something about uh, coronavirus here because uh, now it's running a havoc over all the world so if you if you if you if you uh, if you can if you see the textbooks and you will see that coronavirus is already documented in most of the uh, you know textbooks which will be around say uh, way back uh, 10 or 20 years back so this coronavirus has already been uh, you know documented uh, to cause your common cold most of the people will get surprised by this but this is causing what is this is the uh, you know virus that causes a uh, common cold but what has happened over the time is this virus has uh, you know uh, it has uh, mutated itself so it first adapted in around say for example in 2002 2002 it adapted uh, in the form of uh, SARS SARS that is severe acute respiratory storm and then it uh, again erupted after 10 years in 2012 it erupted in the form of uh, you know again uh, a different uh, coating and then in around 2020 it erupted as covid or coronavirus okay so it has been mutating itself so this uh, this in 2012 it was suspected as mars marsa sorry that is marsia mars so that is um, Middle East Respiratory Syndrome. It was rejected in the Kingdom of Saudi, Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. The first eruption was in the China. The second, so Corona, the second was in the Kingdom of uh, Saudi Arabia. So it was called Middle East Respiratory Syndrome. And in 2002, it has again erupted in the form of coronavirus, I mean COVID-2. So the novel name is coronavirus SARS-2. That is the nomenclature which the viral uh, committee has designated as SARS uh, COVID-2 or SARS-2. So now imagine how can you differentiate a patient that whether he has having corona or not. Because coronavirus has been documented to uh, cause a common cold in humans. But common cold was okay. Our, our uh, immune system used to respond and it used to you know uh, we had to, we have some fever for uh, you know three or four days and then we get okay but uh, what has happened over the time that it is mutating itself and it is becoming more uh, pathogenic it, it doesn't want to leave the host because i think he likes us he likes our you know environment our system uh, it's also documented in different kinds of uh, birds for example bats and uh, another uh, microorganisms so over the time it has mutated you can see now it has mutated uh, within the 10 years it mutated and then it mutated only within the eight years so its mutation rate is also increasing so next time if it is coming again so you will see that it can it can come within uh, you know four years can come again in the two, 2024 so Many of the scientists were uh, on the platforms that were telling that we should make a vaccine against it, particularly the Bill Gates. And if you, study, if you see his TED Talks of 2012, he clearly says that uh, this is not the nuclear world now. The nuclear bombs uh, won't be uh, any use to the country's defense because now viruses have taken the role of them. 
so they have become the you know the uh, that can threaten the whole whole human population but nobody listened to him so that is the way if most of the governments work so now you can see uh, this is a simple uh, diagram of a you know a specimen sterile swab which is having a transport media over here okay so what you do is you just take this uh, you know this swab is from there up to here so it is capped it's sealed first so when you open the cap you just take this out so it will be like this and the tip is made up of rayon like this so use that and you can put it inside the nostrils of a patient okay so put that in the new nostrils and get your specimen out and then put it back inside uh, this media i mean in this uh, in this plastic bag so then what you do is you just pinch here and when you pinch here it releases the transport media so whatever virus is there or whatever bacteria is there it will remain viable until we go for the checking of it so this is uh, the useful and i mean and just an example of a transport uh, you know media another uh, virus so covid can be detected with an another respiratory uh, disease for example respiratory symptom virus can be uh, detected so what they do in the, that case is they first uh, do a nasopharyngeal wash with a two, uh, two to uh, three ml of uh, normal saline then uh, you can see that then the swab is taken um, use a flexible rayon tipped applicator so it has this tip that collects your uh, you know nasal uh, you know from the nose whatever there is it, it can you know stick it to it and then you put it inside and you punch this one push you know just um, try to crunch it and then the fluid will come out and it will remain sus uh, you know susceptible i mean viable until it's tested now it's also used uh, the sterile swabs are also used for collecting uh, samples from the genital tract. So, uh, routine genital tract cultures can be ordered. In general, vaginal cultures are of minimal value. Why? Because uh, vagina, particularly the pH of the vagina is around acidic. So, it's acidic first. Then uh, there will be a plethora of organisms growing within the vagina. So uh, if you are uh, suspecting uh, sexually transmitted disease, for example, if you are suspecting, uh, you know, uh, organism called Nazira gonorrhea, which causes gonorrhea or sphylis uh, caused by uh, Treponema palladium. So in that case, uh, you should collect the, you know, collect these, uh, you know, organisms directly from the uh, uterine opening. That is the opening of the uterus. We call it as cervix. So avoiding the uh, vagina. So what they have is they have a you know an instrument like this. So it can push the lips of the vagina away, so that you can put your uh, you know you know swab here and collect this sample from the opening of the uterus. That is called cervix. Okay. Now uh, again using a uh, sterile swab, particularly the famous one used is star uh, swab modified. It is a modified um, amines charcoal swab. So it has charcoal with it, that's why it looks black. With their digital uh, printed labels, as with every sample they have now. So the, all the genital cultures should be directly inoculated, that is stored onto the pre-warmed. Uh, if you want to you know, culture them, so you, they should be stored, that is storage media, and this is the media, storage media is here, MTM agar. So just pre-warm it, and that's called jumping, jumbek modified thyroid martin agar we have already talked about culture you know cultures if you don't uh, know about the culture media i put up a lecture on culture media uh, types methods i mean culture media types you can go through that lecture and you can find it out okay so here it's telling that it's an enriched media it means it enriches it keeps the bacteria you know or the virus viable up to the time it's being transported and it's a, it's it's and it helps in it's a selection selective media as well so selective means it will particularly point out us uh, to the uh, microorganism which we are looking for for example in this case if we are looking for the sexually transmitted uh, disease i can selectively allow uh, the media will be such that it will only selectively allow the growth of either uh, naziria gonorrhea which causes gonorrhea or treponema palladium which causes the sphylis both of them are sexually transmitted diseases okay for, so for the cultivation of uh, naziria gonorrhea what will it do it will selectively allow the naziria gonorrhea and kill other microorganisms and, or keep them you know uh, their population in uh, less that will keep them in a bacteriostatic mode 
Now transport of the swab immediately to the laboratory as if it is Nigeria Garonia is a very sensitive it is sensitive to the cold so what happens is you cannot you know store it so around uh, needs 5 to 10 uh, so in case of that you have to put it in the uh, you know again in the uh, carbon dioxide it is an incubator so you have to put in constant supply of carbon dioxide inside the uh, you know the incubator if you have to store it at 37 degrees celsius okay so then you can culture it and you can report to the doctor whether it is you know whether the std is you know if it is and gonorrhea and then it is gonorrhea and if it is treponema pallidum then it's fine simple now coming to the ear and eye specimens so when you have some infections in the eye or in the in our ears let us let us begin with the ear first so the specimens of choice again it's an it can be as i told you uh, we can switch between the choices uh, we can uh, use for pus i told you we can either use a swab or we can use a needle aspiration in this case we are talking about here the sterile swab but you can also do needle aspiration if the infection you find it's behind the tympanum you can collect the specimen of choice for external air uh, you have to clean it okay and then use the swab so here the star swab with modified strots media again it's a uh, you know transport media you can go and check it out in the previous lecture that's culture medias it's an, again a transport media it is semi-solid in nature and it preserves the bacteria and you know it's very really selective against uh, one particular bacteria so for but for uh, if there's uh, for otitis media you have to aspirate as asp asp aspirate it using needle and uh, you know ne needle and uh, take it out from the the technique is called uh, uh, tympanocentesis so within this uh, you can uh, from this you can you know just uh, collect your uh, specimen so a swab is not recommended for collecting uh, you know specimens to diagnose this uh, otitis problem or otitis caused infections so a small swab may be used only when the eardrum has ruptured okay so remember in this case that in case of air you can use both you can use swabs sterile swabs and you can use uh, you know needle aspiration based on the location of the infection okay now coming to the eye uh, first instruction is given is do not touch the external skin that is uh, just underlying our eyes so do we don't have to touch it here so obtain the material then you can when you do the culture you do the culture of both the uh, you know uh, your eyes by using this star swab that is modified with a transport media called as stots media okay so you can use the swabs if there are infections in the eye but for culturing you have to take it from both of your eyes now coming to the intubation so as i told you in the beginning in means inside and tube means putting the tube inside the hollow organ so let us talk about this now so intubation if you uh, if you if you have any gastrointestinal problem we can or we have to collect the specimen from the uh, gastrointestinal tract particularly from the stomach we use that so intubation latin means in latin uh, word it's called in in into and tuba means tube so putting the tube inside the hollow organ so or inserting the tube inside the body or uh, body canal so gastrointestinal in, uh, tract uh, intubation for example intubation can be used to collect the specimen from your stomach and as i told you it can be either to detect the uh, i mean uh, stomach ulcers or h pylori which is also linked uh, with the research latest that it can also cause uh, stomach cancer so in this process uh, as i told you in case of the uh, patients we, we put it uh, through his uh, nasal area and one, one of the tube uh, which is very famous for it is used because it's a little bit flexible it's having flexibility so in this procedure uh, a long sterile tube is attached to the syringe and the tube is either swallowed by the patient if it is uh, an adult but if if he doesn't like it then you can just pass it through his nostrils as i have shown in this figure into the patient's stomach and either h pylori or the stomach ulcers so then what happens is specimens are then withdrawn periodically so one end of the tube is going, going to the you know going into the patient's uh, stomach when it passes through his um, you know food pipe avoiding the uh, air pipe so then uh, on the other end where the hand is here in this at this end there's a syringe 
So at periodical, uh, period, periodically, the, um, if the patient has been admitted in the hospital for a particular kind of a disease, so this tube has to be put in and then we can collect the tube, I, I, I mean specimens from at different uh, time points um, uh, for testing, okay. So specimens are uh, when we are required in periodically, so this is one of the way we can do it. So as I told you, the most uh, common tube that's uh, you, you know used in the gastrointestinal tract intubation is the Levine tube. Now coming to the COVID problem, I was not supposed to put it here, but uh, just because the COVID is such a pandemic and it has emerged, so everybody should be having a little bit of knowledge about it. So just I intubation, I read it here. So what you are doing it, that's called endotracheal intubation. So you have put it in trachea. So that's why they use it directly to the mouth, not from the nose. So these are some of the instruments that are, you know, summing up this instrument and this finally it is put on the mouth of the patient. You might have seen in the videos which are coming right now. So this uh, endotracheal intubation is the process of inserting a tube, just as in case of the, um, uh, you know, in a stomach tube. So we call it as endotracheal tube, ET, through the mouth and then while it can reach to the airways, either the bronchi or the lungs. So this is done prior to placing the patient on the ventilators to assist uh, him with the breathing. And it's also used uh, while the patient is on anesthesia or he is on sedation or is having a severe illness that as a particularly in case of COVID positive patient, uh, if it, uh, as, uh, it is, you know, being more severe, more severe inflammation is there, then what happens is uh, the fluid may come into the lungs and that is what is uh, causing the, de the de death of the uh, patients, then the organ failure will take place. But every positive COVID positive patient uh, is, uh, you know, it's not sure that he will die or not. He, most of the patients have been recovering from this, particularly the young ones, because uh, particularly they have the good, uh, you know, immune system, and uh, so don't make it as a, you know, that the, the person who has having COVID positive he has a death sentence on his head. So that's not the case. Okay, the tube you can see particularly in the reports of the many different channels how much recoveries are being done. So there are more recoveries than the death. So that's good news for us. Thanks to Allah. But we don't know for how much time it will be there. The tube is then uh, connected to a ventilator, as I told you, which uh, pushes the air. So it has to be pushed inside the air because the patient doesn't now have the capability uh, to take in the oxygen or uh, you know, deliver it out. So in the end, what I will, uh, if I end this lecture, I will end it with this note that so remember to cluster your specimens. So this is just your one word formula, collection, labeling, you get a tube here, store it, transport it, examine it, and then finally report it to the patient. So thanks for uh, patiently bearing with me and uh, I'm very thankful that uh, to the students uh, for their comments. Uh, keep on commenting and keep on, uh, you know, raising any questions you have in your mind you can raise them on my whatsapp group or you can just you know send your messages directly to my whatsapp uh, you know number so i'll be happy to answer all the queries which you have so please be safe and secure and uh, until then until the next lecture we will meet again inshallah by the time assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh